morning, everyone, and welcome to our service, the Lord's service, we pray, right? So what are we doing today? We are, after we went from a 76-degree day to a 45-degree day, some of us, like Jay, are celebrating. The rest of us are just being obedient and celebrating because this is the day the Lord has made. <laughs> and he made all of them. You know, can't you just drive down the road and look out and see a cloudy sky and say, Lord, all that's going on here to make that happen, that's pretty incredible, actually. I prefer the sunshine, just saying, Lord, but, you know, pretty amazing. Lightning, thunderclouds, snowstorms, hailstones. But it's pretty amazing stuff, and it gives evidence to who God is, right? should increase our faith. So... We are going to sing hymn 543 in a couple of moments here. Uh, when the roll is called up yonder, the lyrics uh, will be behind me if they're not already uh, on the screen. But if you uh, can't read it, just pull your hymnal out. And uh, they are there. So let's begin as we always do, uh, just going before the Lord and dedicating this time to him, asking for his blessing upon us, and uh, just kind of settling our hearts in place for a wonderful time of fellowship with the saints and communion with him. Lord, we just worship you this morning. What can we say, Lord? You have blessed us. As, as the, I love that worship song, Lord, uh, that you inspired beyond all measure. You have blessed us beyond all measure, Lord, because you are a good God, and I am loved by you. Lord, what else do we need? But you give us so much more. But into life also, Lord, comes difficulty and trial. And Lord, you have even given us what we need to walk through that with you and to come back out into the sunshine and the light. Uh, and Lord, we're just so thankful that we have you to walk through this life with. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving us. Thank you for creating this universe and then crossing the entire universe, Lord to die on a cross and then to live inside of us as you do today. We worship you, Lord, this morning. We just, we want to exalt your name, Lord, that men, women, and children would be drawn unto you. We want to be useful in your kingdom. And whatever capacity that is that you have determined, Lord, you distribute the gifts, you set out the works in advance just simply for us to walk in. Let that be a reality today, Lord. So let the people here be blessed, Lord, and we pray that we would, because of our desire to be here, not under compulsion, at least most of us, uh, and through the attitudes of our hearts, Lord, that we would minister to you, just as the priests did in the Old Testament. So, Lord, we ask it all with great thankfulness, gratitude, in Jesus' name, amen. So, uh, you may stand if you can stand. And we're going to do hymn 543, when the roll is called up yonder. shall sound and time shall be no more and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair when the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore and the roll is called up yonder I'll be there when the roll is called up yonder when the roll is called up yonder And the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. Let us labor for the master from the dawn's setting sun. Let us talk of all his wonders, love, and care. And when all of life is over and our work 
that and you may be seated. Thank you, Paul. So glad he took over that duty from me. He's got a nicer voice. Yeah. Not supposed to agree that loudly, Nancy. Oh. <laughs> yeah. No, I want you to lie to me, <laughs> actually. Well, let's see. Did I leave my bulletin? Somebody got a bulletin? Can grab? Oh, thank you. Thank you. I was, <laughs> I, was, I was saying during Sunday school this morning, I was teaching Sunday school, I said, Lord, as the dementia gets worse, let me just remember that you love me and I'm saved. That, you know, that's all, at the end, that's what I want to know. <laughs> if I don't recognize my wife and my kids, just, Lord, you love me, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, right? So, you know, we, we start out with, Jesus loves me, this I know, and then we end up, same thing at the end, right? <laughs> Jesus loves me, that's all I know. Well, uh, we have several announcements uh, this morning. Uh, the ones that are in the bulletin, I'll let you read. We've announced them three or four weeks in a row. Uh, just one note, and that is that the Operation Christmas Child uh, uh, boxes are on the table here. Feel free to come and take some of those. If you need more or have questions, see Jill Goodman. Is she, are you in here, Jill, or are you out in the hall? She, she's out in the hall. Okay, she runs a little cart out there handing out bulletins and, and all that. So uh, you can see her or call the office. You can talk to her anytime during the week as well. So uh, we have a couple of people we're going to have come up and talk about uh, some uh, events or ministries going on. So I would like to have uh, Greg Schmitter come on up and talk about the uh, financial peace study. University. Peace University, right. Good morning. Then Jesus answered and said, a certain man went down from Jer Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise a Levite, when he, was arriving, uh, when he had arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and sent him on his own animal, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend when I come again, I will repay you. We're going to do a class here called Financial Peace. Uh, take this thing off for a second. It's Dave Ramsey's class. A lot of you are probably familiar with him. If you're not, I'll explain it a little bit. Um, Hopefully everyone here is saved. If you're not, that's first and foremost what you need to go talk to somebody about. But there are aspects of life that stress us out, um, whether it's financials, our health, fitness, things like that. And financial um, peace or your financial situation could be one of those big stresses that you have. Um, and that's what this class is going to offer from a bib biblical perspective, how to manage your finances and um, it's not going to only teach you to be out of debt. That's what Dave Ramsey is kind of known as, as the out-of-debt guy. And I, I almost didn't take the class when it was offered here a few years back when John and Leah offered. And I, I only took it because all my friends were doing it. I'm really grateful that I did. Uh, you're not only going to learn how to be out of debt, but it's going to teach you how to be financially secure. You know, how much you should be saving, um, what types of insurances you should have for your particular situations, how to save for kids' college, how to invest. And then at the end, it's going to teach you to build wealth. Um, why build wealth? This is not a prosperity gospel. If you've come here for any amount of time, you know that's not what we preach here. Um, the point of building wealth as a Christian is it gives you the opportunity to be outrageously generous. Um, if we were all, you know, financially blessed here and had great wealth, think of the impact we could have on missions and ministries, um, how far reaching this church could be, or, or the you know, Christian church as a whole. Um, We'd have money to reach out and take care of the injured, the sick, the orphans, the widows, the poor. And when I read the Good Samaritan, you always focus on the guy's old kin passed him by, and then a Samaritan, maybe, maybe not enemy, but not his kin, not someone they spoke with and got along with, stopped and took care of. And that's what I focus on. But at the end of that, this man took care of him, and he had the opportunity to do that because he was in a financial position 
where he could take him to an inn, have him treated and cared for, and pay for that, and told the innkeeper, keep taking care of him. I have the money, and I'll pay you when I get back. Uh, if you've done the class before, um, you know, feel free to come again. I, I think it's one of those things where the accountability and refresher is a good thing. Um, and, and you can also help someone that's new to it, uh, you know, coach them along or be an accountability partner. Um, again, and if, if you feel embarrassed about your financial situation, don't be. Uh, again, if you're saved, that's, that's, that's what's important here. But um, come get a biblical perspective, get an understanding of uh, how to manage your finances and get your family in a comfortable place where you're not worried about it, you don't have to think about your finances, and you can focus on other things and, and giving and wealth, um, building wealth to be outrageously generous. Uh, we're going to meet November 2nd. It's a Monday at 6.30 p.m. for our first class. It's nine weeks long. Uh, we'll be flexible with the schedule because there probably won't be a ton of us in there. Um, it's $130 for the class. It gives you access to... Um, uh, a lot of tools, including budgeting and stuff like that. Um, come see me uh, after church. I'll be cleaning up, and then I'll be hanging out here. Um, I'll teach you how to sign up and stuff like that. If you have any questions, uh, I think that's everything. If we've got a lot of kids, we can figure out daycare, too, and uh, have someone to watch the children while we're doing the class. Thanks. Thank you, Greg. I will just mention that if your situation is dire enough that you can't afford the $130, come and see one of the pastors, and we can talk about helping uh, if there's a real need. I uh, don't want you to miss the class for that reason. Um, we have Carol Nardozzi come up. Uh, Carol takes care of uh, our uh, food pantry ministry, and she's going to say a few words about that. And I'm going to be honest. Nick, Pastor Nick said he's going to be away, but he'll let Pastor Scott know and I didn't hear from anybody, but November. He did let me know. Oh. He just didn't tell you he let me know. <laughs> uh, years ago, when Jean did, um, when she was our leader for Gales, for Gracefully Aging Ladies on Saturday morning, Jean and I would come up a little early, make coffee, and we, the cork was cleaning back then. And um, I noticed the food pantry, the cans were expired, and... Um, Packages were ripped, and it was just a mess. And I'm like, oh, I want to clean this so bad. And Cork says, do it. Kathy doesn't want to do it. And Kathy and Ray were away then. So I, um, I came from a church previously that you didn't do anything till you checked with the pastor's wife first. So I was afraid, but I did. I cleaned that whole thing out. And next thing I know, years later, I'm kind of facilitating it. But it's, we do have cans and we have packages what we want to do november 20 i think it's 21st kathy it's the saturday see i wasn't ready i believe it's november 21st it's a saturday i'm going to have a drive-through um can can well a drive-through food drive i'm asking everybody if everybody brings one can one package anything that's non-perishable and donates it we will have a lot of a lot of um items for it. I'm looking for volunteers to help me that day. I told Nick my main thing is I want to be able to pray in each car. Of course, we'll ask first. Can, can we pray for you first? Give them a track and then give them the bag of uh, food. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. There'll be more out there. And, um, you know, I just ask, watch your dates on things because I know if I was down and out and needed to go to a food pantry and I got things that were dented or outdated, it would probably break my heart to think that I'm only worth, right, did I word that right? Yeah. Okay, so that's all I ask, watch your dates, okay, because I, I do throw those things out. I, we're giving food out the 21st of November, it's a Saturday, I believe it's the 21st, and I want, I'm asking for donations, and if you don't wanna shop, we will take cash because I plan on with the cash buying loaves of bread and maybe even quarts of milk or maybe the powdered milk. We, we drank powdered milk as kids. We didn't mind. So that's it in a nutshell. I know he told me two minutes. So I hope I made it. <laughs> yeah, so donations can be brought down to the church ahead of time, obviously. Uh, Carol's referring to some fresh perishable things. Uh, you can talk to her about uh, either giving money so she can buy those the day of or the day before or arranging to bring them down closer to the date. So just talk to Carol um, 
and she will give you all the details. So the giveaway is on that Saturday. The giveaway to the people is on Saturday that weekend, right? And so we need donations before then. Yeah? Yep, okay. Super. Okay. Thank you very much, Carol. Appreciate that. Uh, let's see. Uh, we have... Is Paul here? Paul Camilleri here this morning? Let's see him. Okay. Paul Camilleri. There he is. Okay. Oh, well, I was going to say lots of nice things about you, but now that you're here, don't worry. Don't worry. He's a middlingly talented artist, you know, lives in Auburn and does uh, commercial uh, graphics work for a living. And if you remember, we had a, uh, uh, what do we call these now, graphic novels? When I was a kid, they were called comics, I don't know. Uh, but uh, he had one for Christmas, the Christmas elf one, right, that we handed out uh, through the school and through the church. Well, he's created a new one called <clears throat> Better Than Candy. And uh, this is a very simple, easy-to-understand booklet about what's really important, and something that, now look, I'm sure many of you don't celebrate Halloween, maybe some of you do, we, we don't really celebrate it in the church or in the school for various reasons, but whether you do or not, there is, if you have people that come to your home to, to get a treat, even if you don't have any treats, but if they're going to show up, now you got something that specifically deals with the gospel and how to get saved at a child's level that you can throw in the bag along with anything else. So we bought about, I think we bought 900 of these. They are out this door uh, at the cart. Uh, we're going to limit this to 10 per family, okay? Because we also were getting them out through the school. We got about 70, 65 school or families connected. That's 650 plus the church. I think we're going to try to give some to Ted Martin uh, as well. So five per family. <laughs> I think, I think Geneva Christian Fellowship is going to get some, too. Let's say five per family, okay? So uh, Jill or Hank will be out there, and we'll just make it quick. We'll just hand them to you on the way out the door. I highly recommend you take these home. We had a video to watch, but we had some technical issues getting it up. We might do that next week. Well, next week's after, after Halloween. Can't do that. So, but there is a video. Uh, how would you get there, Paul, if you wanted to watch that? Is there a simple way to get to the video? Or? Oh, there you go. Right, it's on the back. And we're going to show it Wednesday night. So come to church Wednesday night. Okay. Thank you. Last announcement before we go to our reading. Sorry, long announcement time today. Uh, so uh, Jill Goodman, who's our office manager, uh, financial supervisor, <laughs> accountant, the whole smash, uh, has been getting inquiries about uh, the tithing or giving to the church. So this is not a tithing plea. We don't do that. Uh, but just so you know, logistically we are obviously no longer passing the plate and if you're new here today or haven't been here for a while we always have passed the plate right at a certain point we're not doing that because of the covid thing and we're just trying to you know be compliant uh so you can drop your offering off whatever you want to give in a box right outside the door on top of a cart this box says offering or something it's got a little slot in the top you just drop it whether it's tithing or gifts or you're giving to the building fund or for any other reason uh, put in your cash if you want or an envelope if you want to get a statement at the end of the year saying you gave this much for tax reasons, okay? So there's a yellow box out there, and that's how you can do that. Okay, our reading today is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 42. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption, but it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam that's Jesus, became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. 
all the rest of humanity. That's us. And as is the heavenly man, so are those who are heavenly, the dusty ones that get saved. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Lord, thank you so much. The Bible tells us that we have many and precious promises from you, Lord, and you have guaranteed us by the deposit of your Holy Spirit that one day, when we get called up to heaven to be with you, we will receive a new body, perfect, unable to be sick, unable to sin, uncorrupted. And Lord, we are looking forward to that day. Thank you for the promises we have, the clarity that we have in Scripture, Lord. So as we enter into a time now of just continuing to worship you in song, Lord, let that reality take root uh, in our hearts this morning. Lord, it wouldn't just be lyrics we've heard before and a tune we know by heart so we can just kind of wander off gathering wool in our heads. Lord, but, but help us as we worship, pray, hear the word taught. Open our hearts and our minds, Lord, to your presence, to your scripture, to your plans, Lord, for us. Be glorified here now this morning, we ask, in Jesus' name. Amen.
Father, we uh, praise your great name this morning, Lord. We uh, recognize who you are this morning. We recognize uh, who we are in, in light of you, Father. So we just uh, offer our hearts to you this morning, Lord, that it would be a pleasing sacrifice, and that you would use us and uh, change us, Lord, to be more like you. I give you this time in your name. Amen. Would you, you please? Stand with us? Oh 
God is raging at my feet I can feel Breath of love surrounding me I can hear Sound of nations rising up We will not be overtaken We will not be overcome I can walk Down the stuck and grateful road I can face Every fear of the unknown Children singing, yeah, we will not be overtaken, we will not be overcome. Same power that brought Jesus from the grave, same power that commands the dead to wait, is in us, is in Oh, your grace so free 
washes over me. You have made me know now life begins with you. Yes, your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us know. price you paid on the cross just so we could be redeemed so we could spend eternity worshiping in your presence at your feet lord we love you this morning we pray that you'll be with pastor ray and just bring forth your word speak to our heart and light your church on fire lord amen man when death was arrested i'll tell you i remember that day like it was yesterday how many remember the day when death was arrested and your life began the day you got saved, the day you were born of God's Spirit, the day that you no longer had to worry about anything because He is taking care of everything. Amen? Oh. Wow. You know, sometimes we have to be careful because... Some people can be sitting here going, I don't think I'm that excited. Well, I'm not always that excited either all the time. Life is life, right? And it's not always just exciting. But there are moments like we just had there when if we're in Him and know Him, we're touched in such special ways. And for me, it's a reminder of not only who he is, but what he's done in my heart that I so often forget. It, it's so easy to forget. Let's, let's open our Bibles to Matthew's Gospel and uh, chapter 22. And 
Before I begin, I think an email was sent out to the fellowship. Franklin Graham is calling for a day of prayer and fasting this day um, because of the condition of the country, the election coming up, and how extremely important it is uh, to our nation. Um, God's on the throne, and we're going to be talking about the Pharisees coming, and the Herodians particularly, uh, coming against Jesus, and they think they've got Jesus on the horns of a dilemma. They think they've got Jesus somewhere between the throne of God and the throne of Caesar. (laughs) But they really don't. Uh, Really, they don't have anything because they don't have a knowledge of the truth. And they can't sing with us, and my life began. See, these the, all the things we're looking at in the Gospels is before the church is born. So it's before the actual phys- physical resurrection of Christ. But don't forget that he was slain when? From the foundation of the world. Before time began. Before Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning. He was slain before time began. So you see, and the people that understood this, I guarantee you, the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ, Mary, she, got, she knew that. Simeon, when he, he, he goes into the temple, here's this guy, I think they say he lived to be 104, some people say. And, you know, what was going on when he was 99 and 100 and the Lord promised he'd see the Messiah before he died? You better hurry up, Lord, I'm getting pretty feeble here. And 104, he comes in, takes the baby, and he goes, now I can go home. Whoa. So don't think for a minute that the Old Testament saints were like, ho-hum. No, no. You know, you think about the prophets and you think about um, the men and women who knew God. Think about Rahab in Joshua 2. She had that excitement and she didn't have half of the knowledge. She didn't have a quarter of the understanding. She didn't have a tenth of the understanding that we have. If, if, if you're not excited about the fact, you know, Pastor Scott read the passage in 1 Corinthians 15. We're getting new bodies. Hang in there, folks. Some of you are dealing with very difficult physical things in your life. I, I, I get that. Hang in there because he's coming. And we're not just going to get a new life, we're going to get new bodies. You know, a lot of Christians never even have read that passage. They don't have a clue that we're going to have the same kind of body that Jesus had in Luke chapter 24 when they were all freaked out after the resurrection and he goes, hey, hey, relax. He says, does a ghost, does a spirit have flesh and bone as you see I have? Come up and touch me. He did everything he possibly could to make them understand the reality of what had taken place. You and I cannot comprehend what that must have been like for those apostles, for those disciples. Can you imagine? He told him he'd come back and he came back. And he says, touch me. He ate some fish. He ate something. He, he comes right down to the level where we live and he goes, look, he can eat after you get a new body. No calories, man. This is just incredible. And so, We're in the middle of this, I was going to say feud. It's not a feud. It's it's misunderstandings. I want you to remember as I read this passage, Jesus loved these men just as much as he loves you who walk with him and talk with him and know him. And in chapter 22, after the whole parable of the wedding feast there and all that's been going on in verse 15 of chapter 22 it says then the pharisees boy they just wouldn't quit then the pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk how they could kill him and they sent to him their disciples with the herodians they're an interesting group we'll talk just a little bit saying teacher We know that you are true and teach the way of God. Boy, they're going to just lay it on thick here. And teach the way of God in truth, nor do you care about anyone. (laughs) That's some way to put it. For you do not regard the person of men. 
Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? Listen, underline the next word, or. They had it all wrong. Or not. (laughs) But Jesus perceived their wickedness, so now we know they're wicked, and said, why do you test me, you hypocrites? That was not a compliment. Show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius, and he said to them, whose image and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, okay then, give to Caesar, give back. It literally means to render, means to give back what's his. To give back to Caesar, therefore, the things that are his, that are Caesar's. And, underline the word and. See, they had it all wrong. And Jesus says to God the things that are God's. And when they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. So the same exact day, the the Sadducees, who say there's no resurrection, and that's why they're so sad, you see, okay, they say there's no resurrection, came to him and asked him, saying, teacher, Moses said that if a man dies having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. By the way, that's true in the Scripture. Now, there were with us seven brothers. Now, try to unravel their logic here. The first died after he had married and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. You know, we look at that and go, what? What? I don't even like my sister-in-law. <laughs> I, no, I don't mean me, in case my brothers hear anything on the tape. But, I, you know, but you see, in that culture, this was supposed to happen. And God commanded it in the Old Testament scriptures. And having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. Now, there were with us seven brothers. <laughs> This shows you how ridiculous some of the questions can be that we ask God. The first died after he had married, and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. Likewise, the second also died, and the third, even to the seventh. They all died. By the time the fourth guy got married, he must have been thinking, I'm going to check my food out with the dog before I eat it. What's going on here? List, last of all, Verse 27, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had her. They're thinking, now, they're thinking, we got him. Jesus is so cool. Jesus answered and said to them, you're mistaken. Not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection... They neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels of God in heaven. But concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read? He was constantly saying that to the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees because they prided themselves and would always ask the people, thus saith the Lord, didn't you read this? Read this, read this. And we keep the law. And he's going, you guys ever read your Bibles? Have you not read what was spoken to you by God saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the multitudes heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. Let's pray. Father, I'm astonished at your teaching. I believe all of us here today are many times astonished by your teaching. But Lord, we went one step further and we received by faith and believed by faith that you are who you say you are and that you were who you said you were and that you are the God of the living. For that, we are so very thankful. So what's been going on here? Oh, I didn't say in Jesus' name, amen, yes. (laughs) I knew I forgot something. Um, I'm getting like you, Scott. (laughs) Uh, So here's the deal. 
What's happening here? Well, he comes in, he rides in on the donkey. He's fulfilling all kinds of scripture that those guys should have been going, hey, here he is, my goodness. This is exactly what it says in Psalm 118. You know, the, the Psalm we memorized when we were going to seminary and have known it ever since. The stumbling block for the religious. And then he cleanses the temple. And they're going, what in the world? Who do you think you are? God goes, I know who I am. Do you know who you are? Who do you think you are? What, what gives you the authority to come in here and ruin our little scheme, our little sham, our little taking advantage of the people is what they were doing. Then he gives them the fig tree illustration. And so basically, Jesus comes back to him and says, by what authority did John baptize the men that he baptized? And I'll ask you that question. And they went, we can't tell. And because Jesus knew that they can't tell meant he won't tell, he says, neither will I tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. That's fair. You won't tell me by what authority, John, then I'm not going to tell you by what authority because you know very well that God sent John. In fact, you know so well that you're afraid to say anything wrong because if you make an accusation against me or John, they're going to have a riot. <laughs> and that's not a good time. That means they're going to lay hands on you. And so Jesus comes back with three parables. Bing, 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 right in a row. He goes, there's two sons. The first one said, I won't go. He went out and did what he was supposed to do. The second one says, I'll go, but he didn't do. And he makes a parable out of these next three parables to show that you're the guys. You're that second son. You said, oh, yes, Lord, but you never went. And they knew it. They condemned themselves in the parable of the vineyard, the workers of the vineyard and so he gives the parable of the sons about their responsibility the parable of the wicked vine dresser which was a parable that was condemning them for rejecting him and then on top of that he gives the next parable the parable of the uh, wedding feast and that was a parable to show them that God was now rejecting them. Whoa. And listen, these guys understood that he was doing that. It wasn't like he didn't understand. And now we come to this. And uh, they're going to really give it to Jesus now. We're going to have, you know, the, 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 is it lawful to pay taxes? You know, like they're so righteous. And, and then the Sadducees, well, what about resurrection? Whose wife will she be in the resurrection? You know, how many angels can fit on the end of a pin? Yeah, where did Cain get his wife? Did Adam have a belly button? You know, don't be afraid to talk to people about God. They only ask the same questions. There's only five questions they ask. Find out what they are and just learn how to answer those. They don't, they don't know anything else because they don't read their Bible. Oh, don't forget, there's so many contradictions in the Bible. That's a big one, okay? Just ask them to show you one and then work from there. Don't ever be afraid to say to people, you ready for this? I don't know. Chuck Smith, the founder of Calvary Chapel. I go to look in his commentary sometimes when I don't understand something and I'm reading the whole thing. He's got a comment on every verse except for the one I'm looking for. I've heard Chuck at a conference teach the Bible stuff that I thought I knew about and, and he goes, I don't know what that means. And he just goes on and reads the rest. I, mean, you, I feel like getting up and going, Chuck, you can't do that. You're the teacher. What do you mean you don't know everything? Nobody knows everything but God. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Don't have an arrogant attitude. If you're not going to go, if you're going to share the Lord with people, you need to be kind. You need to love them. You need to be honest, though, and you need to be truthful. And this is what Jesus is doing. 
So the Pharisees, in verse 15, went and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk. Never a good idea to try to entangle God in his talk. You're not going to win. And they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are a true are true and teach the way of God in truth, nor do you care about anyone. What he really means is, what they meant was, you don't take the opinion or consider what man says compared to what you know and say because, you know, you're claiming to be God's son. And teach the way of God in truth, nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of men. I want to make a comment about that about these two verses. Luke chapter 20, verse 20, says this about the same subject, about the same attempt to attack Jesus. It says this. The Pharisees' true motive was, that's what the writer says of Luke, so they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be righteous. I can't think of anything more dangerous than pretending to be righteous when you know deep down in your heart you're not. Pretended to be righteous that they might seize him in his words, there was their motive, in order to deliver him to the power and the authority of the governor of Rome. And then we can finally get rid of him. And I was really thinking about this this morning. I think the Lord really spoke to me about this. A lot of our questions are based upon fear, and usually fear of man. What are people going to think of me? What if I make a mistake? I'm embarrassed. What man or what men really need is a greater fear or reverence toward a greater fear of God. Isn't it ironic that the religious leaders of the nation of Israel didn't fear God? How incredibly ironic. The people that were supposed to be telling, the, the, the guys that were supposed to be telling the people about God, they didn't have a reverence or a fear for God themselves. And I can tell you why, I think. Because God was showing me some things. In Acts chapter 4, right after Pentecost, Peter, you know what he did. You don't have to turn there. I'll just read it to you because you know this. Peter, with a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit, and by the way, the Scripture is very precise about this in the grammar. It was a refill. It wasn't the same filling they got on Pentecost in chapter 2. This was another one. So you ever feel like you're running out of gas? He gives refills. D.L. Moody once sent to a lady, she, you know, you know the, the lady's asking about, you know, how come you, you, you need to get the Spirit again? He goes, ma'am, I leak. And if we're honest, we all leak. And, and so, here's what he says. Can you imagine saying this to the religious leaders, everybody respecting all the authority of these guys? And Peter, in verse 8, says, Then Peter, filled, refilled with the Holy Spirit. By the way, that's consistent with what the epistle says in Ephesians 5.18. Be ye continually, in the grammar, it's be ye continually being filled. It's something that's supposed to be constantly going on in my life. Then Peter refilled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, you rulers of the people and elders of Israel. Who's he addressing? He's addressing the same men that he ran away from 10 days earlier when they put Jesus on the cross because they were afraid, he was afraid, that they'd get put on a cross with him too. And they might have. If we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man... The, the man at the gate beautiful that they had told to get up in Jesus' name, by what means he has been made whole, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified. He's pointing right at, you guys crucified him. 
Now, Peter knows he crucified him too. We all crucified him. But they didn't know. He says, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, it's by him that this man stands healed before you. Don't, don't be giving us any credit because we couldn't heal a mosquito if we wanted to. This was God's doing. Do you see what Peter's doing? Peter no longer had the fear of man. I don't blame them for being afraid when they were crucifying Jesus. I'd have been afraid too. They all abandoned Jesus, it says in the scripture. It says in Zechariah chapter 13, strike the shepherd and the sheep are scattered. That's exactly what happened. But when Peter came in a boldness, he came with a strength that I don't think he knew he had. I think it just came out as the Spirit manifested itself. And I think that's what's going on. You see, these guys don't have a fear of God. Therefore, if you don't fear God, who will you fear? Man. That's a dangerous place to be if I'm fearing man when I know the living God. Because it's the same power that rose Jesus from the grave that's living in me. You know what my problem is? I forget that. And then the fear of man starts to well up again. And that's why I need to go back and say, Lord, I need a fresh filling. So whenever I'm fearful, it's not a bad idea to say, hey, I need a fresh filling, Lord. Would you fill me again? And by the way, you think he would? He does. He will. I've, I've had it happen. Many of you have had it happen. And you're like, wow. And you, you walk away from the person. And go, I didn't even know I knew that verse. And I just quoted it. You go to your wife or your husband and say, you wouldn't believe it. I was in Walmart and all of a sudden I'm teaching the gospel. And I quoted from, from Acts chapter 4 and I didn't know I knew the verse. Well, if you're putting the verses in, what does God promise? I'll draw out the verses you need at the very moment that you need them. Notice he doesn't do it before or after. He does it at the very, he's good to his word. If you put it in, he'll draw it out. And you know what's great about him drawing it out? He draws it out at the right time. I don't ever know when to use it. He just goes, this is a good time right here. Here's a verse. Come, Holy Spirit, I need you. Come, sweet spirit, I pray. Come in your strength and your power. Come in your own special way. See, I'm, I'm wanting God to come in the way I want him to come. And he always comes in the way he wants to come. Lord, I didn't want to come that way. Yeah, but your way wouldn't work, Ray. So I'm going to give you the way that it will work. All you have to do is pay attention to me. I'm always trying to to get your attention and speak to you. So he says in verse 17, tell us therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? That was their mistake. I told you to underline the word or. They're thinking, hey, if he says we don't have to pay taxes, man, this is great because either the government is going to be upset with him, Caesar, or his constituency the people that do receive Jesus are going to go, maybe this isn't the Messiah if he's a friend of Rome. And Jesus knew that. You know, why did Jesus know that? Because Jesus is God, and he knows everything. And so they're saying, tell us, therefore, do we pay, you know, just answer our question, yes or no. <laughs> I was watching a couple of the debates and with Amy um, Barrett, is it, for the, for the Supreme Court. And uh, they wouldn't let her talk. They just said, a yes or no answer, please. <laughs> Some things don't get taken care of with a yes or no answer. In fact, most things don't get taken care of. With it. They didn't want to hear what she had to say. That's all there was to it. Just yes or no. We've got to move on to the next question. I'm thinking, what's this rush to move on to the next question? You know, so I, I don't understand that, except for, for manipulation. And I don't know who's manipulating what or whatever. I don't know that. But God does. Be sure that God knows. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? We just want a yes or no answer here, okay, Jesus? And then we'll leave you alone. Because we can indict you then. 
and then we'll get our way. We can kill you. But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, why do you test me, you hypocrites? Now we know their motive because Jesus just gave it to us. They're, they're a bunch of hypocrites. And so he says, why do you test me? Show me the money. Show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius, which was about a day's pay. This was the poll tax. There was three different taxes. I mean, they just really, you think we have it bad? They were taxing, taxing, taxing. And Matthew was a tax collector. So I think he specifically knows more about this than the other guys, the writers of the New Testament. And he says, the poll tax is here. Show me the tax money. And he said to the Pharisees, whose inscription and image is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, well, he says, you're right. So therefore, give back to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Remember I told you to underline the word and? And, see, it wasn't an or situation. Jesus, Jesus wasn't saying you could do this or you could do that. He says you do both. Pay your taxes and then, and, and then give back to God the things that are God's. Caesar's image and superinscription was on the coin because that's what it was in their language and the Greek and the, the culture and a, a, a woman there with her. And it was, it was Caesar's inscription or superscription on the coin. And listen, God's image and God's superscription is upon you and me as believers. See, God's superscription is upon us. So Jesus would say, your problem isn't with Caesar. You don't have a Caesar problem. Your problem is with God. Give back to Caesar the things that belong to Caesar and unto God the things that belong to God. And the scripture bears that out in the epistles. We all know Romans 13. God has ordained all authority and then it tells us very specifically in um, Romans 13. It says, render therefore to all their due taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Boy, that pretty well covers the gamut, doesn't it? I just don't pay my taxes because it's just, a, you know, you know that's, I can give the money to God. Well, God doesn't think that's right. And, and by the way, real nice guy was on the throne during this time. Caesar, Nero. Real sweet of a guy, sweetheart of a guy, you know. Used to take Christians and light them with, and make them human torches by dipping them in wax and then riding around his garden in his chariot naked going, the light of the world, the light of the world. The man was insane. Some scholars believe it was right after he witnessed to Caesar in Rome that he lost his mind. Because instead of by the conviction coming to God, it, he was driven away. And God loved and loves Nero. We know that, right? God is no respecter of persons. God is love, but he's also just. He cannot deny who he is. And so, you do both. It's not an or situation. It's give to Caesar what's his. And if the superscription of, is upon, of God's image is upon me, my problem is, am I giving to God what's God's? Because I'll tell you what, God doesn't need anybody's money. But he wants your life. And God showed me in Psalm 27 how and why it worked for David but wasn't working for these guys. The Lord is the light of my salvation. The Lord is the strength of my life. Turn to Psalm 27. David writes, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. So he's my light and he's my life. Here's a question to ask yourself this morning. Is 
the Lord my life or just my light? Do I just have Jesus for fire insurance so that I won't go to hell? Now, I think it's a good idea to have that fire insurance, and it's part of the package, but is he my life? In Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, he says this, God, Christ, who is my life. In my margin, I write, in every Bible I've got, is he? Search me. Oh, God, know my heart. See if there be any wicked, or especially since there is so much wickedness in me. Search me, know my heart, and lead me in the way everlasting. Look what he says then in verse 4. This is what the Pharisees didn't and weren't doing. The Herodians, the Pharisees, the scribes and the priests, some of them were, Nicodemus did, Joseph of Arimathea did, eventually. They got saved. It tells us in Acts chapter 6, verse 7, I think it is, it says, many of the priests became believers. They, they got saved. You bet they probably did. They were in the temple, an 80-foot curtain, 12 inches thick, ripped from the top to the bottom. That, that probably made a little noise. Look what it says, verse 4. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto thee, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. Let's read the next phrase together. All the days of my life. Notice it doesn't say, as soon as I get to heaven. When I get to heaven... Man, I'm going to desire the Lord and I'm going to seek Him. No. He says that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. David did not have the luxury of Christ in me, the hope of glory. David didn't have the Holy Spirit living inside of him. You and I do. How much easier would it be because He lives inside me to all the days of my life on earth before I even get to heaven to dwell in the house of the Lord, to behold the beauty of the Lord. That word means, in the Hebrew, to gaze upon him. Sort of like Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter, the finisher of your faith. To behold the beauty of the Lord, gaze upon him, and to, watch this, to inquire in his temple, let's read the next phrase, for in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion in the secret place of his tabernacle. What is he saying? Not after I get out of the trouble. Did you ever catch yourself or someone else, hear someone else thinking or saying, man, as soon as I get through this mess, I'm really going to get my, you know, get my relationship with Jesus right. I'm going to get that vertical where it belongs, man. As soon as I get done with this cancer, as soon as I get done with this financial problem, as soon as I get done with this, this kid that is so wayward, as soon as I get done with my parents who just drive me crazy because they're always making me do stuff I don't want to do. Look what he says. To inquire in his temple in the day of trouble. I'll tell you what, if you don't inquire in the day of trouble and get that peace that passes understanding, you're never going to have what David's talking about. He said, well, what did David have to do? Oh, not much. His father-in-law is coming after him with 3,000 troops who should have, he should have been, you know, fighting the Philistines who was a real enemy. And King Saul, who was out of his mind, he sends 3,000 guys after his son-in-law. Uh, Saul, we got a little problem here? Are you a little off balance? Well, Saul was a lot off balance. But the thing is, to inquire in his temple for in the day of trouble. Listen. Are you hidden in his pavilion in the secret place of his tabernacle in the day of trouble? That's the only time it matters. <laughs> I remember Pastor Scott teaching about submission. Wives, submit to your husband. He says, guys, it's not submission if your husband goes, we're going to Hawaii whether you like it or not. Okay, honey, I'll go. I submit. 
That's not submission. Submission is only submission when you don't want to submit. <laughs> Amen? Kids, when you don't want to do what mom and dad say, it's only when you don't want to do it. They say, we're get, look, it, I'm your parents. You obey me. I'm getting you a brand new bicycle for Christmas. Do you understand? Okay. I can yield to that. I just don't want to yield to the things I don't want to yield to. So there. Because we're all the same. I want his peace in the time of trouble. Because that's when I need his peace. Amen? Do you know that he's promised it to you? You can claim uh, this promise for yourself. Even though it's an Old Testament verse. These guys that were coming to Jesus didn't know a thing about that. Shame on them. They memorized the scripture, but they couldn't apply it because their hearts were not right with God. Just like sometimes, even as your pastor, just ask my wife, ask my kids, ask my grandchildren, even as your pastor sometimes isn't walking in the light. But it's a great place to be, isn't it? Didn't you feel you were in the light this morning, man? And my life, how does it go? It was arrested. You know, when my life was arrested, how did it go? When death, yes. How could I forget that? That was the very thing that Jesus told me the day I got saved. He goes, Ray, now you're never going to die. I was worried about that from the time I was nine years old. And at 29, 20 years later, I got saved. And he goes, now you'll never die. I said, wow, God, that's what I've been worrying about. And he goes, I know. That's why I said that. And I'll never forget those words. He can't take those words back. He's not an Indian giver. Death was arrested for me that day. I'll never forget it. And it was a joy that has stayed with me through the journey, as Michael Card says. So, Render, therefore, to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. When they had heard these words, they marveled and they left him and went their way. Sort of like Satan in the, in the uh, desert when Jesus was tempted the three ways for a more opportune time. They weren't done yet. I didn't mention this, but he sent some of the Pharisees with the Herodians. The Herodians were sucking up to Herod, and they were on Rome's side. So some of the Pharisees really were boiling over about that. But typically, the Pharisees and the Sadducees didn't get along very well until they had a common enemy in Jesus. And it says, the same day the Sadducees... Says, let us try. We can, we can get to Jesus. Maybe we couldn't trip him up politically, but we're going to trip him up theology, theologically. So they give him this ridiculous scenario. And by the way, the reference for the man marrying, um, uh, the, 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 the wife marrying, how does it go? <laughs> I get confused. Well, let's, yes. The teacher, Moses said, that if a man dies having no children, verse 24, his brother shall marry his wife. His brother shall marry his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. So in other words, if my brother died, I'd have to marry Christine, my sister-in-law. Or one of my three sisters-in-law. And the purpose was for the inheritance because the inheritance was connected to this. And that way they wouldn't lose their inheritance and that first child would be raised up as the seed because the guy that died didn't have a child and now this person would have a child. It's, it's um, Deuteronomy chapter 25 starting in verse 5. I don't have time to look at it right now, but you can look that up. Moses said, verse 24, that if a man dies having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now, after he had the first offspring, the first kid, then all the rest of the kids would be his. It was just so that his brother would be able to, you know, keep the inheritance. Now, there were seven brothers, and you heard this in there, and every one of them died. 
who is this woman? <laughs> you know, I don't know if I want to marry her, man. Everybody keeps dying here. The whole thing was ridiculous. They were trying to make a ridiculous point. But here was Jesus' point in verse 29. Jesus said to them, you're mistaken. Now look at what they're mistaken about. You're mistaken about not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. Now, I'll tell you one reason that they didn't know the power of God is the Sadducees only believed in the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Old Testament. They didn't believe in resurrection. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in anything spiritual. They didn't believe in an afterlife. So based on that, Jesus is thinking, you guys don't even believe in resurrection. What is your point here? But they press it anyway, and they go, whose wife will she be? in the resurrection and he says you're mistaken not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God so first he deals with the power of God and that's why I had Pastor Scott read that passage how we get new bodies they didn't know the power of God the resurrection is the power of God right for in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage but are like angels of God in heaven now I know some of you have just fantastic marriages, and you're like, oh, boy. I mean, I'm not going to be married to my husband. I'm not going to be married to my wife. When I get there, don't worry. God has something even better, infinitely better. And there are some days that you can't wait for that, right, <laughs> girls? <laughs> okay, well, I don't have to be married to this guy for eternity at least. Okay, but the thing is, or vice versa, and he says, you don't know the power of God, for in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given to marriage, but are like the angels. Now, you got to be really careful with this one, because I go to funerals sometimes, sometimes funerals that I do, and if the people that are the surviving members, and they don't know the Lord, I mean, they're always, you know, oh, he's up there talking to the angels. Uh, the angel came. My mother-in-law came and visited me in my bedroom. No, she didn't. Luke 16 says there's a huge gulf. You can't get back. You don't come back. Reincarnation, that's not what we believe, right? Yeah, they don't come and visit you. They don't. Now, it's okay to talk to your deceased mom, but if she ever starts answering you, <laughs> well then, Ray, what is that about? Guess what? Satan can imitate anything. Oh, you're saying that might be satanic? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying, that that might be satanic. And it might be just the pizza ate last night, okay? But the fact of the matter is they don't come back. And by the way, this proves you don't become an angel when you die. Some people think, oh, now they're angels. No, they're not. He says you'll be like the angels in that you won't need to procreate. You don't need to, you don't to, need to multiply and, and, you know, and conquer, okay, and have children because you won't be having children in heaven. We'll be like the angels in there will be a fixed number of saints just as there is a fixed number of angels, two-thirds of the angels, that did not get kicked out when Lucifer was kicked out of heaven. So th that number is already, we know what that number is. Well, you and I don't know, but God has two-thirds of the angels. That's never going to increase or decrease. Once the millennial kingdom is over, and we're in the new Jerusalem, the new heaven and the earth, will be a fixed number. The saints. No more Jew and Gentile. Just God will be our God, and we will be his people forever and ever and ever. Amen. Underneath are the everlasting arms of God. But are like angels of God in heaven, but concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham? Notice what he didn't say. Jesus didn't say, I was the God of Abraham. No, he says, I am. Indicating what? Abraham's still alive even though he's dead. Here's what's great and what's interesting. Jesus says to Martha, Martha, I am the resurrection. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, 
physically gone, this dirt, yet shall he live forevermore. And that's why Pastor Scott had to read that passage with a new body. Again, kids, we talked about this last week. You're not going to be floating on a cloud playing a harp. You're going to have a new body that never gets sick, never dies, never gets cancer, never goes to the dentist again. I mean, you, you eats anything you want, never has to sleep. Kids don't question those things. They just go, I mean, I don't have to go to bed. They're not, they're, they're not wondering if it can be real. Just tell me how it works, man. I like this. I can just stay out playing. That's right. Never sleep, never die, never get sick, never get a cold. COVID won't be there. Hallelujah. We won't camp there. I am the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Even Job understood that. The oldest book, some people believe, in the, in the whole Bible, and Job Chapter 19, verse 25, for I know that my Redeemer lives, how did you know that, Job? And he shall stand at last on the earth, and after my skin is struck off my body. But the word is, he uses destroyed, but the word in the Hebrew means to strike off with violence. I guess you're dead, right? And after my skin is destroyed, this I know. How in the world did Job know this? That in my flesh I shall see God. What's he talking about? 1 Corinthians 15, the pastor Scott just read. I'm going to see God forever in my flesh, my new flesh, my new body. Guys, you need to help people see that and know that. They don't know. People that don't know the Lord, they haven't got a clue what happens after you die. The Bible specifically shows us what happens after we die. Whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. Oh, how, how my heart yearns within me. Job couldn't get, wait to get there. How my heart yearns within me. My eyes shall behold him. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12. Now we see through a glass darkly. We see, see as in a foggy mirror. But then shall we see what? Face to face with my Savior. And when the multitudes heard this, they shut up. <laughs> they were astonished at his teaching. Now, I'm going to close with this. It says the Pharisees and the Herodians were astonished. Back up there in verse... Um, they marveled. In verse 22, when they heard these things, they marveled. But guess what? It doesn't mean they believed. And we find out later they didn't believe. They were just marveling. You can marvel all your life and not get saved. You can agree with the pastor. You can say amen. You can go to church every day and not be saved. Marveling won't save you. And either will be being, being astonished. They were astonished at his teaching. Now, many of the multitudes, though the common people, received him gladly, and many of them did get saved. And God knows how many. And it doesn't really matter. The fact is that you don't get saved by being astonished or marveling. You just marvel and get astonished. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. That's the only way you're going to heaven. There is no other way. There's no other name under all of heaven whereby a man must be saved. If you're not saved this morning, you better get saved because he's coming and he's going to take us home. And one day we are going to get those new bodies when the trump of the Lord sounds. When the trumpet of the Lord sounds and time shall be no more. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. My prayer is you will be there too. Amen? Father, thank you for your word. This grueling test that the Pharisees and the Herodians and the Sadducees, and next week we'll see them finish off trying to talk about the authority again. 
Lord, you have all authority. We even sing a song about that. Maybe we're going to hear that. All authority has been given to you, and you've given it to those that know you that we can share it with others. Help us to be faithful in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're not going to sing that song, but we're going to sing a song about Christ building his kingdom. Why don't you stand with us? Clap your hands, stomp your feet. again increase in us we pray unveil why we're made come set our hearts ablaze with hope a wildfire in our very souls Holy Spirit come invade us now we are your church Hunger and we thirst, refuse to waste our 
kingdom, not in the United States, but we, we certainly want it built here too. But you're building your kingdom everywhere in the world because this isn't your kingdom. Your kingdom is coming because you're the king. And the king's not here physically yet. When you come, you're going to come. It's not going to be because of anything the church does. We just want everyone not to perish, but all come to a repentance, saving knowledge of you. So, Father, get us out there doing what can only be done between now and when you do come. Because once you come, there's no one to save in heaven. Uh, so, Lord, your kingdom will be here on earth, but you will be the ruler and the king. It will be one kingdom your kingdom. Let it come soon. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.